Well, welcome everyone. So today's lecture is going to be on um, Banach and Nekash Babushka condition and the Lidwitz Kenya Baretsi Babushka conditions. And in particular, we're going to be talking about saddle point problems and generalized uh, problems uh, for the approximation of better of the Lekin methods. <clears throat> okay. So what's the plan uh, of, of the talk for today? So let me just uh, quickly. Uh, should you one I should have this here. So this is uh, the goal for today's lecture. So understand how uh, creeping flow can be modeled in in, um, <clears throat> in a uh, numerical way. And of course, we'll do all, also all the theory associated to this type of stuff. And the, the roadmap is quite long. So we will start with a simple generalized problems. So the generalized problems is in, in, in uh, uh, the setting of the generalized problems we'll be discussing is Banach spaces. So we have linear operators, so general settings. Banach spaces. And we have linear operator between Banach spaces and we would like to solve a general problem of the type uh, we have V. Banach and reflexive. And W is for the moment just Banach. So the first part of the theory is going to be uh, on, on, on these two conditions. Uh, sorry, uh, the other way around. So W is also reflexive. So the image space is reflexive. And we have a linear operator A that goes from V to the dual space of W. And uh, as we know, this is equivalent to having a bilinear operator A which goes from the product space VW into real values. And this is a operator that to pairs UV associates A on UV in R. And here instead we have an object that in U it associates A U in W prime. And the two things are perfectly equivalent because you can always write a u as the bilinear operator little a of uv by fixing u. And this is a linear operator in v because a is a bilinear operator. So these two guys, a belongs to linear operator of v times w with values in r, while a belongs to linear operator between v and w prime. So the exposition is identical in the two cases. Um, I prefer the left, the left side. So this is what we are going to be using for the expositions that we have. But many people prefer the right ones. So uh, according to who you talk to, you, you'll see expositions coming with the bilinear operators or, or exposition coming with the linear operator on the left instead of uh, what's written on the right. Okay. I like the one on the left because this is basically a one-to-one -one mapping with what happens with respect to matrices. So I can see this as a matrix. So A is a sort of a, a, the equivalent, the infinite dimensional equivalent of a matrix. Well, on the other case, it's uh, you still have to work a little bit in order to get the matrices. Okay. So the problem that we'll be interested in is the following. So the problem is the following. Given F in W prime, find U in V such that, and you can write the problem in both ways. So A U equal F or A of U V equal F in V. And that's for any V in W. Okay, so this is the same as that. 
And uh, this is, of course, on the left, this equality has to be intended in W prime. And of course, uh, first of all, we have to understand what we mean for this problem to be proposed. So we will have to understand exactly what are the conditions for this problem to be proposed. We cannot apply a Lattmingham here for several reasons. First, it's, we're not talking about Hilbert spaces. And second, we have two different spaces for the function U and for the function W or for the function V. So for the test functions that you have here and for the trial functions, which is the space of the functions where you look for a solution. Okay, so we are looking for a solution U in space V and we test with functions V, which are in the space W. We would like to understand when this problem is well posed. So let's start with, um, um, with a couple of very, uh, so mi minimal definitions of well postness. Okay. And for this particular case, this is uh, due to Hadamard. And the proposal says that uh, there exists a constant that we'll call alpha such that for any function f which is in w prime, there exists a unique solution u in v and this solution U is such that its norm is controlled by the norm of the data. And this is identical to what we have already seen in the, in the, um, in the standard Hilbert case, in the Lachmilton case. So we have exactly the same type of structure. However, there's a lot of uh, things which have to be um, looked very carefully in this particular case. So let's try by, let, let's start by observing a couple of things. First of all, we want the problem to be proposed for any solution F, for any function F, which is in W prime. And of course, if you want this to be the case, then this implies in particular, this little thing over here. So we say one, it implies that A, has to be surreactive. Okay. Second conditions that we have in this particular in these particular things is that there there is uh, for each one of those f there is only one u that is in v. So this mean this means number two. that A has to be injective. And the third condition that we have, this condition over here, can be rewritten by simply observing that this is exactly identical to writing one over alpha. And since F has to be equal to AU, this is, oops, This is a u w prime. Okay, so this is telling us that a has to be bounding. And the way that we will look at this is, uh, in, in some sense, there are some conditions between the operator a. Uh, there, there are some, some um, relationship with the operator A that needs to be satisfied. And these three things are not just uh, unrelated one with respect to each other. And in, partic in particular, the reason why they're not related with one respect to each other is because A is a linear operator. So there's some consequences in the fact that A is a linear operator between Banach spaces that come with this. And all of these three properties, so one, two, and three, are different. Um, different faces of the same metals, let's what you say. Faces of the same metal. And in particular, if you want to make the connection with the analysis, pure analysis, functional analysis, they are the faces of the closed branch theorem.
and they are the faces of the open map theorem. Okay, so let's uh, let's first give a couple of um, um, of results and a, and a couple of notations that I would like to use. And uh, I will give uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for these things uh, to be satisfied. And these are usually known as the Banach and Ekash-Babushka conditions because Banach is the one that proved both the closed range theorem and the open math theorem. And Nekash applied this to the problems uh, between Banach spaces and Babushka applied this to the finite element theory. Okay, so this is this, these three things uh, are all interconnected within each other. Okay, so let's start with, with the following thing. So we know that A is a linear operator between B and W prime. So A belongs to the linear operators between B and W prime. And we saw accordingly that A transpose goes from V from W to V prime. And this is just by, by definitions. And uh, as we saw before, we already have that A instead, the bilinear operator goes from W, P times W with values in R. Okay. So we, we will call in the, in the next uh, part of the lecture, K for us is the kernel of A. And the kernel of A is simply defined as uh, the space of functions V in capital V, such that A V W is equal to zero for any W in capital W. Okay. You could say that as the function V in V in capital V such that A V is uh, zero in W prime, which is exactly what I wrote here is A V times W is equal to zero for A V in W. And we call H instead the kernel of A transpose. And so this is the functions W in W such that uh, now I write the same thing as before, but then I move the transpose on the other guy. And this is instead for any V in capital V. <clears throat> okay. The space that is usually used for, uh, for finite dimensional operator that is also uh, commonly associated with these guys is the, the orthogonal space to a given set or to a given subspace. And for our a particular case, uh, we're not going to be use orthogonal spaces because we are not in the um, in the Hilbert case, we are in the Banach case. So what we are going to be using is instead, if you have Z, which is a subspace of H, or it's a, it's a subset of H, we call Z polar polar space, polar, of Z or annihilator. I, I never know how to write this. So, I'm sorry. so I'll just use it, use the polar, which is probably uh, more, more convenient, is the space um, is, is the subset of functions which are in the dual of the H such that Fz is zero for any Z in capital H. Uh, sorry, for any Z in capital Z. So basically I'm, I'm, I'm defining this space to be this, the functionals which uh, evaluate to zero when applied to every entry Z in the space capital Z. And now by construction and by continuity of the duality, we have, 
that two properties are trivially specified. First of all, Z polar is a closed subspace and kernel of an operator is always a closed subspace. Okay, so these two properties are trivially true. And as we will see, uh, in, in infinite dimensions, the, um, the, there's a there's a relationship between this and the operator A and the polar of the operator A, which are coming trivially. And they, they are coming trivially for the following reasons. So if I look at the kernel of A, by construction, the kernel of A is also the polar space of the image of A transpose. And the reason why this is the case is because you can always write, uh, if you have an entry which is in the kernel, so you say that A, U, W is zero for any U, then you can always write this as U, A transpose W, and this is for any V in K. Okay, so this is, the, this is true. And so there's a relationship which is trivial between this, this it's two spaces, and of course, the, the same is valid for the, for the transpose operator. So if I take the kernel of A transpose, this is the image of A polar. So it's the polar of the image of A, which means if you take uh, all W for which A transpose W is equal to zero, then this is the same as saying, uh, asking all Ws that make A U equal to zero, and this is for any W in H, which is the kernel of A transpose. Okay, this property is trivial. It comes simply by definition of the way that this has been that this has been um, constructed. And now the property which is less trivial is the fact that if you um, if you look at the general polar space, the dual so the polar of a polar not necessarily is equal to to Z itself unless you start from a Z, which is already a closed image, which already, which is already a Sorry, I don't know exactly what happened. Uh, let me check the things are still going on. Okay. Sorry. So I was saying uh, this is the um, most common ways of representing the closed range theorem. And it states, uh, well, basically, is a rephrasing of the property that if I take the polar of a polar, uh, do you actually see my screen? Yes. So the polar of the polar is equal to Z if and only if 
we start from a closed uh, with a closed uh, set and and of course if this is an implication it says that if you take the kernel of a and you take the polar of the kernel of a this is equal to the image of a transpose if and only if the image of a transpose is closed And of course, I can do the same if I take the kernel of A transpose and I take the polar of that. This is equal to the image of A if and only if the image of A is closed. Now, the most natural question that arises is why do we care about the fact that this image is closed? And well, let's start by considering a couple of examples. Okay, and so the couple of examples that I would like to to keep in mind are the following the following examples. Right, so so let's say for example a trivial, simple, and trivial example. When we work with Banach spaces, we have to be careful. <laughs> So let's say, for example, that we have a linear operator A that goes from H10 of omega with values in L2 of omega, okay? And the space, the, the, the operator A is defined in this way that A V is identical to V for any function V, which is in H10 of omega. Now, of course, uh, this is the most, the simplest possible example that one can think of. And we have an issue here. And the main issue that we have is that if you look at A, this has two, this has a few properties. So first of all, A is not surreactive. And this is because there exist a functions uh, G in L2, and such that the gradient of G is not in L2. Okay, for example, if you take a function which is continuous, this is the case. Okay? If you have a function which has a jump, this is a, uh, but it's bounded, it's a function which is in L2 of a domain omega, but it's not a function which is continuous, which is, a, which is in H1. <clears throat> Since A is not so reactive, uh, what, what you can say for sure is, that um, there exist so for for um, however let, let me let me let me just uh, observe the following thing as well h10 of omega which is coinciding with the image of a in this particular case is dense in L2 of omega. And from the way that we wrote this, the kernel of A is actually equal to zero, okay? And because there's an identity there, so the only trivial, uh, the only obje object that actually makes A is equal to zero is the zero object, so if you take P equal to zero, okay? So what we have here is that the kernel of A is equal to zero. And if you look at the kernel of A transpose, how do we define A transpose first of all? So if you look at A transpose, so A transpose is an object which is defined. So let's call this guy here, this is equal to V, and this is equal to W prime in our notations, which by chance in this particular case is also equal to L2, but uh, we don't care about this for the moment. Okay, so L2 of omega is W prime. So A transpose should go from W, which is also L2, with values in H minus one, which is the dual space of H10 of omega by just by convention, we call this H minus one. And this is exactly V prime. And is the object that to any functions u for any q in L2 
it associates A transpose Q of U as the L2 scalar products in the domain omega of UQ. Okay, so this is the definition of the of the operator that we have because the operator A is just the image. So the it's the uh, we word this as A transpose Q. And in particular, it's just UQ, okay? In this particular case. Hmm? So if I look at this, then what this is telling you is that if you look at a function which is in L2, you can always interpret that function as an, an element of the dual space of H1. Uh, and it's of course an element of dual space of H1. And also due to the denseness of H1 zero in L2, what we have here is that um, if you have that U Q is equal to zero for any Q in L2, then that means that U is equal to zero simply because the L2, the H1 norm of the function U contains the L2 norm. So we are just measuring things uh, with, with the, <coughs> Quality with the scalar product in L2 basically. So this is equivalent to writing the scalar product of U and Q. And so this also means that the kernel of A transpose is also equal to zero. Okay. So and if you were in in finite dimensional in finite dimensions. So we have A kernel of A equals zero and the kernel of A transpose equals zero, what we would obtain is that A is invertible. In finite dimensions. And the reason why this is the case is because all norms are equivalent in finite dimensions. So you can, can, you can measure things with the same norms on the left and the right. In infinite dimensions, however, in Banach spaces, this is not enough. Because we have the function that we have that the transpose object is reactive. However, uh, what we don't have is um, Sorry, we have that the kernel of AT is, is, is equal to zero, but we don't have the reactivity automatically. Okay, so the fact that the kernel of an operator is equal to zero does not imply that that operator is injected in all the ways. Okay, so you don't have this, this connection between the two things. Okay, <clears throat> you need something else. So the, the other thing that you need to show, of course, and the reason why this is not working is because if you look at the image of the sky, this is dense in L2, but the image of A is not closed in L2. Because you can take uh, any Cauchy sequence, you can take a Cauchy sequence, uh, um, you, you can write any element of L2 as a limit of something which is in H1, uh, but you, this doesn't imply that the object that is in L2 is also in H1. Very simply, okay. So, so for, for any for any W n in L two Cauchy such that W n converges to W not in in V, then A W n. So there is uh, then. There, there does not exist U in V such that so let me write this in this way. You can write V and in L2 intersected. So Vn converges on V W in V in H1. And Vn in the image of A in this particular case, 
Then if it's in the image of A, then we know that there exists a VM, which is in B, such that a VM is equal to WN, but VN does not converge to V in V. Okay. So in other words, uh, what you're showing here is that AVN is always equal to W n, but if we take the limit for n equals to infinity, the resulting object is in W, but in V. So you, it's not closed. So the image of the operator that we just wrote here is not closed. And this has consequences. And in particular, one of the trivial consequences of this is that you cannot prove, you cannot find a solution for the problem a u equal d if this is not the case. So this is a necessary condition. And now what we would like to show is that this necessary condition is in fact uh, a, a consequence of being bounding or that is equivalent to the fact of the bounding. Okay. So the, the, um, the, the main theorem that is used for this is, the, is showing the equivalence between the open mapping and the close range using the open mapping theorem. And the close range theorem. So let me just take this out and put this before and put the mess in it. Okay. <clears throat> so what I would like to show here is that the image of A is closed if and only if. Now here we have to be careful because uh, I don't want to assume anything about uh, the kernel being zero and, and everything else. So, uh, but what I want to show is that there exists an alpha such that uh, for any um, W in image of A, I switch to the mobile connection. Okay, so I was saying um, for any there exists an alpha such that for any W which is in the image of A, then since W and we have the property that A U, which is equal to norm of W is greater or equal than alpha, the norm of U. And if you write it in this way, then uh, this U is in V and uh, the image of A is, W prime, sorry. So this is in W prime, and this is AU W prime. And what this is telling you is that the property of being bounding 
is equivalent to the problem of asking that the image of A is closed. And now we will start by proving this. And then we will apply this to a couple of problems which are of interest for us. Okay. So let's start with the first implication. And the first implication is showing that if the image of A is equal to the, uh, is, is closed, then um, what's written on the right is true. <clears throat> uh, in this, in all this, I didn't say anything about the theorem and the open mapping theorem states the following. If A is reactive and A is linear mapping, of course, then A of U is open for any U open. Okay, it's a very simple theorem. Very powerful here as well. So if you have a function which is reactive, so if you take A and you uh, the map itself maps. So for example, in the case that we had before, when you had A, which is the identity interpreter between H1 and L2, that it maps a closed set, which is H10, H10, the, the full space is closed. It's a Banach space with the norm in H10 and, and with the norm in H1, and it's a closed space because it's complete. Um, it maps H10 into uh, H10 as a subset of O2 measured with the O2 norm, and that's not a closed set. So we just proved that, and we just showed that. And we can also see some, some very simple examples. You can actually make a function which is uh, constant everywhere except at the, the at the end where it goes down linearly to, to zero and you can make that approximate uh, the constant function different from zero so it's no longer in h1 zero but just uh, just a simple example you can make that later on okay so let's try let's try this proof and let's try to understand how this actually works so we would like to show that if the image is closed, then you can write what's written on the right. And typically, the way to start feature. Okay, so we have two sets. There are two large balls, which we said this is V, this is W prime. So this is the target space. And we have the map A that maps and for the moment we're not assuming that the image of a is a full set of numbers so we're not we don't ask it to be if the image of a is closed which is what we're assuming and you want to put the rest then image of a is a subspace And uh, if it's a linear subspace, what we have, we have that we can apply with image of space. So this implies, in particular, that A, uh, and, and in this particular case, so A is surreactive between V and image of A, and image of A is seen as a Banach space with the with the same norm of W. Okay. W prime tilde. <laughs> okay. Okay. So then, uh, the the next thing that we want to 
we want to see is what happens then if we uh, look at the mapping of a open set. So we take a open set here and we call this open set, this is zero element. We take the unique ball here. And here we have to be careful. So I will be using B, V with zero as a center and one as a radius. Set B, V, zero, one is unit ball in V. So that is V in capital V such that the normal V is smaller, is smaller than one. And this is a open set. And by the open mapping theorem, what we say is that the open set, uh, let me use the green, V1 centered in zero radius one. So BV1 maps into oops, into a subset of the image of A. Let me show this as that. Why? Okay. Now, if I look at that guy over there, A of BV01 contains zero of W. Zero W because BV contains the zero W. So if I apply that to zero, I get zero. Okay. And in particular, it's the open set by definition. So there exists a gamma such that the ball of radius gamma in the space W centered in zero is all included in, is strictly included in the image of BV01. So just to show you the picture, there's a zero here and there's a small ball here, which we call BW0. Gamma. Uh, they shouldn't touch. So, sorry about this picture. Make sure they don't touch. Okay. So we have the ball centered in zero, we reduce that, uh, reduce gamma. Okay. So we apply the open mapping theorem and we construct the image of that guy, and then we construct gamma such that that is the case, okay? Now, by looking at the picture, for any object which is by, so, and now this is, this comes thanks to the linearity of the operator. So this is the essential part. And the essential part is the following. Now I take any object W, which is in the image of A, and I rescale it in such a way that it falls between the ball of radius delta that I have there. Okay. Now, and let's let's take a lesson. So for any W, which is in the image of A, for a non-trivial W, so let's say that this is not zero. So what we can say is we, we can we can call omega bar the object which is uh, for example gamma over two, but you can set any any smaller than gamma number here, uh, and you take w over its norm in w prime. Okay, so if I look at this guy over here, this object belongs to the ball, to the image, sorry, belongs to the ball W0, 
gamma by construction. And this, in terms, belongs on the image of BV, zero one. So that implies that there exists a V, which is in the unit ball. of PV01, such that A, V is equal to W bar. Okay? Um, okay, let's call now set Z, to be what? And now we want Z uh, to be basically the, the um, let, let me, let, let, let's try to revert what we want to obtain here, right? So we would like to obtain that something independently of what, it, of what you scale it with, uh, it, it, you, you would like to show that the A is a bounding operator. So we started from any function W, and we have shown that W bar is this guy we scaled. And now we would like to conclude that for any W in the image of A, then the Z, which is um, uh, Z such that Z is equal, AZ is equal to W. And we know by linearity of this operation, that Z must be equal to omega bar times two norm of omega W prime over delta. Okay. And now we conclude simply by observing that uh, if you if you look at the norm of a z, then the norm of a z, which is equal to the norm of w, by the way that this has been written, is greater or equal. Um, well, sorry, I have to go the other way around. Otherwise, I, I, it's difficult to show this. So let me let me uh, let me look at the norm of W first. So the norm of W by construction, from the way that they wrote this, is uh, in W prime is polar equal uh, the norm of Z smaller or equal than the norm of W. I got lost for a second, sorry. Um, Okay, so V is in BV01 such that AV is equal omega bar. And so we know in particular from this, we know from this that the norm of V is smaller or equal than one. And uh, what we want to show is in reality that, uh, so this is the point here, this is the point here. I should not have called that V. So let's call this, Z. this is the Z. There's this Z in BV01, such that AZ is equal to W1. And what we have here is that the norm of Z is more or equal than one. Then what I want to show is that, I want to show that V, which I call, as I did before, um, Z 
just that guy over there. So and this, so I, I, it's the pre-image of that guy. So I, I, I think I got something. I, I got confused about a couple of things. So this guy over here is the guy that they want to multiply with the norm of W in W prime and divide by gamma. It's not. Uh, so it, it has to be, it's, uh, what I want to exploit is the linearity of these operators. And the fact that if I, if I want to exploit the linearity, I want to make sure that this guy over here is scaled with something that then I can cancel out when I, when I, when I apply the, the multiplication. Yeah. So in other words, what I'm, what I'm saying here is that if I now apply A, uh, A to V, then what I obtain is actually, I mean, yeah, this is W that I started from, which is this guy right here. Okay, and the reason is simply because from from by, by starting from this guy over here, which is a rescaled object which belongs here, I know that there exists an object which is in the image, which is in the bar in the in the ball over in this one. And now, if I rescale this object by linearity, I can still say that A is equal to W. Okay, so if I now proceed in this particular way, then uh, if I now proceed in this direction, what I have obtained is that uh, I can control what is the norm of A V, which is equal to the norm of Z times two over gamma, the norm of W, W prime. And uh, what I know here is that this guy over here Um, why am I getting the, the, the other? Sorry. What I want to show is that the normal V is more equal than this guy over here. Okay. And uh, since I have just shown that AZ is equal to W bar, then this is more equal than one, which is the norm of Z times the norm of A and B, which is what I wanted to show multiplied by two over gamma. Okay, now it's okay. So what I obtain is that AV from here, what I obtain is that AV is greater equal than two over gamma normally. Okay, and this is ending this part. So ending the first part of the of the inequality. Sorry, I got confused a little bit with the with the with these guys over here. And you should be able to reconstruct the thing. So what we do here is we first go from one side, so from V to the image of A, and we have these guys over here. And then we restrict ourselves to the closure. If we know that the image of A is closed, what we, what we can say is that the map that is there is an open map. So I take the unit ball in the starting point and I transform this to the set of the, of the image of the unit ball. And by the open map theorem, I know that this set is, is an open set and it contains zero. So there exists a delta, there exists a gamma such that the ball of radius gamma is only a tiny pair. For any W, I rescale the W in such a way that it falls in here. And since I've rescaled it in such a way that it falls in here, I can find an object Z, which is here, from of which this W bar is the pre image, which is what I wrote here. So and there exists a Z for which a Z is equal to W bar. And now what I want to do is I rescale this Z and I set that equal to V in such a way that a V is equal to omega, which is what I started from. So I basically divide omega bar by this guy. And what I would obtain is that by linearity, a V is equal to omega. And now of course, since I know what is V, V as a norm, which is one or equal to the norm of Z times this norm, the norm of Z is strictly smaller than one by construction. And I have that this guy over here is exactly A V. And so I conclude, A V is greater equal than two of gamma times V. 
Okay. <coughs> now let's go to the other direction. The other direction is a little bit simpler. Not that this was complex. Uh, it's just, I just got confused, sorry. So the other direction means that if I have a v, which is greater or equal than alpha norm of v, then I want to imply that the image of a is closed. Okay, so this is what I want to prove. So I start uh, as usual. Uh, I start with the sequence, which is in the image of a. And what I know is that uh, this sequence is a, um, and I want the sequence to be Cauchy. Okay. And since this is the image of A is in a Banach space, is included in a Banach space, independently whether the image of A is close or not, then uh, there exists W, which is the limit for WN in, in W, right? Okay. So let me move this. <coughs> now, of course, for each WN in the image of A, there exists a VN such that A VN is equal to WN. And in particular, what we know, we, we know that we assume that the A VN is greater or equal than Vn with alpha. So this is in V and this is in W prime, and this is exactly equal to the norm in W prime. So this is the hypothesis that we started from. And of course, this implies in particular that um, if when is Cauchy, Sorry, if Vn is Cauchy, this implies that Vn is also Cauchy. So this implies that there exists a V in capital V such that Vn converges to V, but A is bounded and continuous, A is continuous, that implies that AVN converges to AV, which implies in particular that A is closed. Image of A is closed. because this belongs to the image of A. Is it clear? Okay, so this was uh, the easy, the easy part. Okay, now, of course, uh, one can, can uh, uh, try to summarize all of the things that we said so far. And one of the most important way to summarize these are the following things. So these are equivalent statements. Which are the one that we are going to use for our micro, for, for our implementation and for our analysis. Okay. First, first of all, statement number one: A T is surreactive. Is the same as asking that A is injective. and the image of A is equal to the closure of the image of A. Second equivalency is A is bound, oops. I don't know what 
happened. Eric. He's bombing. Which means that there exists an alpha such that a u in v is greater or equal to an alpha normal u in v. And for um, the if subcondition sorry, this is a u w prime condition. Is satisfied. Which means there exists an alpha such that the infimum for W in W prime um, and the soup V and Captain V of A V. Um, I think this if so should be the other way around. So this is the if on V uh, in capital V and the soup of W in capital V. Okay. And now the reason why this is the other way around is because this is the definition of a UW prime. So this is the same as asking that. Okay. The same is valid for saying for a transpose. Okay. And now uh, let's ask ourselves whether we can say something about uh, um, <clears throat> something more specific about cases which are, for example, cases of interest in the case uh, in which the spaces are reflexive or in the case in which, for example, we're using Hilbert spaces, okay? So for example, what we wanted to, what I want to show, what I want to discuss a little bit now is the following. If A is a reactive from B to W prime and alpha is greater than zero, the property of being uh, bounding on the image, which means uh, for every W in the image of A, there exists V, which depends on W, which is on V such that A V W is equal to V and the norm of A V W W prime is creature equal than alpha at the norm of W. So the property of being bounding on the image is uh, implies naturally also the property that A T on V prime is bounding. And this is for any W, in capital W, okay? So the reason why we have this is by the surreactivity of this operator. And in some sense, what we have shown here is that all of these things are, are somewhat equivalent to each other. So you have that the image of A 
uh, is closed if and only if the image of your transpose is closed, and then you can get a lot of these uh, conditions uh, together. So the fact that you can do this for any W in in in, in capital W is because A is reactive. So you can replace that in the full space. Here, you have to be a little bit more careful. And now the thing is that the converse, so P2 implies P1. If V is reflexive, but not elsewhere. Okay. So it's it's not obvious that you have if you have the second condition, then the the, the first one is included. You can only do that if the, the space field is reflexive. And of course, for us, uh, the case that we are interested in the most is the Hilbert case. And so the Hilbert case is the one that we're going to be uh, using the most. And so Hilbert case. And Bretzi Nekesh, uh, I'm sorry, Anak Nekesh Babuska condition. So A goes from V to W prime, V, W prime, so V and W are Hilbert. This particular case, then there exists an alpha such that for any f in v in w prime, there exists a unique u in w in v such that a u equal f and u is bounded by the data, which is also equal a u. If and only if this is equivalent to asking two conditions, there exists an alpha to and zero such that, and now the interesting things about this is that you can write this as the, the two if soups. So this is if u in v, W W in capital W and you can write here a U W norm U norm W and here we have V and W. And actually there's an equality here in this particular case. And now I copy this as this. And we have the other condition, which is the second condition. In soup and in W, and this is now switched. So we take the in soup in the other direction. So this is B and B for Hilbert spaces. For Banach spaces, for Banach, two becomes cur of a t equal zero. Okay, so in Hilbert spaces, one and two are perfectly equivalent. So not, not a, well, they, they're not equivalent, but you have to satisfy both, okay? So in a certain sense, the second one, it's like being satisfying the first one for a transpose. So I'm basically asking the in-soup condition for both A and A transpose. So I'm asking that both A and A transpose are bounding. And for Banach spaces, uh, condition number two can be replaced by simply asking the kernel of a transpose is equal to zero. So if you have the first, the first is the same as asking that A is injected. 
you cannot have kernel of A is different from zero because otherwise the infimum on U and V would, would give you zero. And it's, it's, uh, it's telling you, sorry, it's, it's telling you that the kernel of A is zero and that the image of A is closed. So the image of A is closed says that the bounding property is satisfied and that uh, it's satisfied for any U in the space capital V that is the kernel of U is equal to zero. So this is asking kernel of A is equal to zero and A image of A is closed. While this is second condition is replaced with Banach spaces simply by asking that the kernel of A transpose is equal to zero. And uh, you can actually show that the here in the spaces is a perfectly equivalent all to each other. Okay. And in particular, also, what we have is that the Lax Milgram lemma, uh, this is important, so the Lax Milgram we have W is coincident with V, and Lax Milgram implies B and B. The converse is false. So sometimes in the literature, uh, you find these notations um, of the BNB condition uh, written as the generalized Lux Milgram uh, condition. However, be careful because in reality, Lux Milgram condition is a Hilbert property. So it's a property of Hilbert spaces. While the bits, the Banach and Kashpagushka condition is not a property of Hilbert spaces, it's a property of Banach spaces. So saying that Hilbert spaces so that the, so the, 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 the BNB condition is a generalized Banach-Milgram lemma. It's like saying that Banach spaces are generalized in the space. So it's not exactly the same, right? So be careful about this. So the converse is false. So the fact that the Lux milgram lemma implies the BNB follows trivially because of if you, if you, if you simply reply to the condition of the, BN, of the Lux milgram lemma here, which is the coercivity, and then it automatically satisfies both one and two. Okay. And you obtain this simply because you have that A U U is greater or equal than alpha norm of U square. And you can simply rewrite this as A So uh, this is valid for any u, for any u and v. Then uh, it's also valid if you take the infimum, and it's also valid if you take the supremum independently on the order in which you take infimum and supremum. So both both conditions are satisfied by by this. Okay. So I mean. Uh, the, it's it's not as trivial as, as I wrote it here because then you have to replace U with B and so on and so forth, but uh, it's it's quite simple to show that this is the case. And it, it comes for free from the fact that a U is bounding if you have electricity, electricity property. Hmm? And also that A transpose is bounding if you have the electricity property. So, Let's apply this to mixed problems. So the applications to mixed problems is uh, something that we will um, well, we start today, and we will finish next time. The essential part of, of what we've been discussing so far was uh, trying to invert a, a operator uh, not between the same spaces. Of course, uh, from the numerical point of view, I haven't said anything about how to do this and how to actually solve the problem. And it's clear that if you want to solve this problem, you have to have compatible approximations between the various spaces. And this, uh, the in sub conditions that I wrote here, are the necessary and sufficient conditions for the operator to be vertical in some sense. And in particular, 
uh, it's it, it's equivalent to asking that there exists a writing verse of the finite dimensional version of the of the operator, and uh, you know, we will see how this goes for for the actual application of the problems. So, saddle point problems are a um, generalized version of It's probably not the correct way to write this. Let's call this mixed problems. So these are subtle point problems only when you have a symmetric linear operator, but the, the theory that we're going to say today is going to be much more general with respect to that, okay? So we assume you have two operators, two spaces and two linear operators, two spaces, V and Q, and two, for what we're going to say, these spaces are Hilbert Ross, and two operators. So A, the maps V into its duo, and B, the maps V into the dual space of Q. Okay. And A is linear operator between V and V prime, and B is a linear operator between V and Q prime. The general problem that we want to solve is the following. We want to solve given F in V prime and G in Q prime, find UP in V Q such that, and then we have AU plus B transpose P equal F and BU equal So if you look at it in this way, this problem is a problem that arises whenever you have a Lagrange, whenever you have a constraint that you want to satisfy. So in other words, if you look at this equation here, you should interpret B as a constraint that you want the solution U to satisfy. And P is the Lagrange multiplier associated to this constraint. Is that clear? These are usually often called also saddle point problems. And when you have A, which is a, a symmetric linear, sy symmetric uh, operator, so the dual of A is equal to A, then you can recast this as a uh, problem, uh, as an absolute problem, as a saddle point problem on, on, the, on the energy spaces, okay? Okay, so first of all, Let's uh, start to understand when this is actually uh, proposed. So first of all, we, we want to make sure, one, that G belongs to the image of B. Of course, if this is not the case, we already know that there is no chance that we can solve this problem. All right, so if G belongs to the image of B, then we have the following, the following characteristics. We would like to have G in the image of B so that means that there exists a function that we call UG such that B of UG is equal to G. And if you rewrite this in this way, then you can split uh, the solution of your problems. You can split the problem that you want to solve using the following, the following notations. Now you said, uh, let me call K, the kernel of, actually, we called K the kernel of A, so let me call Z the kernel of B, okay? And uh, let's write U as U zero plus uh, clearly, U0 belongs to 
z and we if u0 belongs to z then b of u0 is equal to zero and b of ug is equal to g by construction so with this particular construction what we would have what we'd have is that you can write the problem as a of u0 plus b transpose p equal f minus a of ug this is very similar to what we did with boundary conditions so this should come come back to, to your to your attention uh, in, a, in a very similar manner with respect to what we wrote uh, in the past okay so we have this at this point and then we are looking for b of u0 equals zero okay so we recasted the problem as a problem in which g is equal to zero and of course by the definition of the um, by the definition of the a operator this object over here is also an object which is in ft which is in v prime so you can recast the problem by simply ignoring g so whatever you have it just ignored g and just solve the problem with b is zero equals zero <clears throat> so let's do that okay so let's restrict our analysis to g equals zero or replace f with f minus a u g for the moment. Okay. So nothing nothing changes with respect to what we tell. You know, of course, here we we have a couple of things that we have to be to be careful about. And the couple of things we have to be careful about are the following. Uh, we have a mixed problem, and we want to make sure that there exists a unique solution u zero p to this problem. And we have also the fact that we cannot ask for the kernel of b to be trivial. If we ask them for the kernel of b to be trivial, then the only possible solutions for this problem would be u zero equals zero. So the kernel of b cannot be trivial. And in fact, the larger the kernel of b is, the larger is the space in which we look for solutions. But since we are restricting to the kernel of B, then we might as well just try to understand what happens if you restrict also the test functions to be in the kernel of B. Okay. And in particular, we observe the following, um, the following things. So if you take A of U0, and we multiply this with B0, and then we look at what happens here, we have B transpose P V0, this is equal to f v0 uh, let me write this historically as f tilde let's not use the capital f let's just use f tilde okay and we look for v0 which are in the kernel of z, then what we currently have here at the moment, we would have that this by construction is zero because v zero is in z. Okay, so that's exactly the same as writing p b transpose v zero. So we are left, we are left uh, v zero. Well, z of course we can do that because z is closed. Okay? And Z is a, is a linear subspace of B. So we have that A of U0, V0, equal F tilde, V0. And we have just shown that this is true if and only if B and B is satisfied. Okay. And so, we will write the B, B, B and B conditions uh, in, for, for the first equations. We have the first conditions that we have is that we want to have the inf soup. And this is for u0 in z, v0 in z of a u0, v0 needs to be controlled. So we know this is to be greater or equal than alpha, but we know that this is actually an equality. And 
And the same thing in the other way around. So the two conditions are, need to be satisfied at the same time. So one, if you want to have a solution for the first problem, for the first equation of the problem, we have this is to be satisfied. Okay. And also we know that this is the, if this is the case, then there exists a unique u zero in Z such that the norm of u zero is smaller or equal than alpha norm of tilde in V prime. <laughs> okay, and now if you look at the alpha norm, norm of its theta u prime, then you can you can actually keep going here and express everything with respect to what we had before. So we have alpha norm of f. No, sorry, this is not alpha; it's one over alpha. So we have one over alpha f norm of v prime, and then. Uh, by continuity, we have a u g is equal to b, and now we would like to write this uh, plus the norm of a norm of u g v, and this is the norm of a in v prime, and there's still one over alpha in front. So A is a bounded linear operator, UG is given by the solution to G, and we have this property here, okay? So this comes simply by asking that there exists a unique solution to the first problem. And of course, we restrict ourselves to the space Z. So we don't need to check for the subcondition on the entire space V, but just on a subspace of that. That's important, and it will be used uh, in the in the future for for some of uh, some of the things. Okay. So given a solution u zero, let me write this problem here as U problem. I'm sorry. Just one second. So once we have a solution for the U problem, U solution to U problem, then we would like to understand what, what is needed for, for, for the solution of the B problem. So the thing is find P such that now at this point, uh, what we need to what we need to find is uh, we need to replace uh, the the only equation in which we have the function p and try to to figure out whether we could find a solution for that. And in order for that to be to be possible, of course, we cannot eliminate p from the equation, right? So we would like to find p such that and then we write this as b transpose p v. And at this point, we have on the right hand side minus a u v. Remember, u is equal to u zero plus u g. So a 
it's minus a u v plus f v, which is the same thing as writing as minus a u zero v plus f tilde v. Okay, just by 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 the construction of the things here. And this is our header for any V in the space capital V. And we will call this P problem. And of course, now we have all the instruments that we have seen before, and we know that for that to be bell post, uh, in, in the in the Hubert in the Banner case, what we have, what we needed to ask is that the operator B transpose P has to be um, it has to have zero kernel and it has to have closed image, and in particular, we need to have that B transpose is a surreactive operator. Okay, so the the, the two conditions that we had. B and B one plus B and B two were BT so we have kern of BT is equal to zero and image of BT is equal to the image of BT close and plus and plus we had that B is so reactive. So this was what we needed for the uh, for the exact solution of the, for, of the problem that we had before. <clears throat> um, And in particular, what we have seen so far is that we want to have um, the, the, all of these this, this things are equivalent to the following, uh, the following property. There exists a beta greater than zero, such that B transpose P is greater or equal than beta model of P. And this uh, B transpose P is in V prime, and this is beta P in Q. For each P in Q. Okay. This is also, uh, it can be rewritten as an impsu condition as well, which is also uh, the same as asking as we said before, there exists beta greater than zero such that the infimum of the supremum, so there's infimum in P, supremum in V of B transpose P V, or same thing, which, which we write this as B V. is controlled by beta. And in particular, we have seen that this can be set equal to zero. That it does equality there. Okay, so this is the second condition. And if you look at the literature, these two conditions are usually put together, so this is one. And it's usually called electricity on the kernel or ink soup on the kernel condition. And that's the ink soup condition for the operator A. And here we have, this is usually just, taught, just called ink soup condition on B. 
And this is L care on A, and this is the in soup on B. Okay. Questions so far? Now, the, the interesting thing about this is that if you look at the um, at the function b, which is uh, the object which is written on the right hand side here, this object here hides a couple of properties and hides a couple of things, uh, which come for, for free from, from analyzing the problem from the, from the point of view of what we had before. So if you take v, which is in z, if you take V, which is in Z, this part is equal to zero. So that implies also that the right hand side is equal to zero. So if you look at the property of A U plus minus A U plus F, uh, which is this guy, which is written on the right here, this guy, which is written on the right here is an operator that then lives in the polar space of the kernel for, um, the kernel of B transpose, okay? And the reason why is that is, is because if you take B, which is in, 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 uh, in the kernel of B, then this part, this part over here is zero for any test function which is in, in, the, in the polar part. So in a certain sense, what we are saying is that F minus A, U, A F minus A U, which is the operator L, uh, belongs in the Z polar space. So that tells notice. This is L belongs to V prime and L V zero is equal to zero for any zero in Z, which implies that L belongs to Z polar. So one could we could could uh, could arrive to the if sub condition also by passing this direction. So one could have uh, the same property that we had before simply by uh, showing that if you take the closure, so the polar of Z, um, and then and you look at the fact that the image of a B transpose has to be equal to the polar of Z. And when you take the polar of that, you, you have that this is, uh, um, this is, it needs to be close for everything to, to work. And of course, the closure of that is equivalent to the image condition that we had before. Okay, so now, the once we have this uh, out of the way, the, the two conditions that we want to ask for the problem to be proposed. To summarize, we have A U plus B transpose P B U equal F equal G for F G in V prime called W prime, uh, sorry, not W prime, but Q prime. There exists a unique U, P, and V, Q. Such that this is, this is satisfied. Now this is if, and only if three conditions are satisfied. One, int soup on the kernel. So equals Z is the kernel of P. E. So if U and Z V and Z of A Q B. There exists alpha and beta, such that the same 
for the transpose. That means we can replace this there. And the third condition is again another instant condition. Um, this time is the insoup on, on the, the transpose operator. We have to be careful about this. So we know that the infimum, if I take the infimum on you, this would be zero. So I have to take the supremum on you. This is equal to beta, this is greater than zero. Zero. So these three conditions here are the three conditions that allow us to conclude existence in uniqueness of a solution for subtle point problems. And moreover, what we have is we have that A is bounding, and we already had the condition on U. And of course, we also have the B is bounding. And the B is bounding in particular is bounding for, uh, and, and we will use that to have a bound on the on the right hand side that we have there. So we have the U norm V As um, what we had was this part. Okay. And what we didn't say yet it was that uh, B. From the way that we wrote this, B U G in V prime is greater or equal than the norm of the beta norm of U G, which implies in particular that B of U G, which is equal to the norm of G. In Q prime, and this is the norm of B of U G in B. This in particular implies that I can replace the second term that you have here on right by this is one over alpha, and then you have F B prime plus uh, the norm of A on V prime divided by alpha beta, and then this is the norm of G in Q prime. Okay, and of course, uh, if you want to have the the inequality we, we could we could apply a triangle inequality to obtain the control on the full normal view. So if we apply triangle inequality to get the control on the full normal view, we have the full normal view is well we apply simply u zero plus u g minus u g, and uh, this is the u zero plus u g. Is more or equal one over alpha norm of f and b prime plus one plus norm of b prime. Uh, I have to be careful here. I think um, so. I have to show this is g one over beta. Uh, I have to be careful about how I write this. Sorry. So this would be 
okay, the prime or the alpha beta, and then I have to add on the right hand side gq prime plus one of the beta along of the k. Uh, sorry, along of g. So this, this has to be massaged a little bit and we can write this as, this remains FB prime and then you have, this is a B prime plus alpha and pi alpha beta. And of G, G prime. Okay. And of course, uh, we have uh, the conditions on P and the conditions on P can be uh, uh, obtained simply by observing that uh, B is also bounding and the P problem that we were solving before, let me find it again, is here. So we have the conditions on the P problem that depends on this guy. So one can, insert the estimate on U0 and the estimate on V and show that this BTP, which is equal to that guy over there, is controlling uh, the norm of B, the norm of B. There is bounding with respect to the norm of B. And so one obtains norm on, on P, it's written on the left hand side here. So one would have that the norm of P in Q would be one of a beta, and then this would be uh, the norm of L in V prime. And when I have to find L, I have to find L as the sum of it all of these guys that I have here on the right. So this guy over here is my L. So this is exactly equal to one of a beta. And now I have the norm of A, the norm of u plus the norm of f in v prime. And as you see, I can then reuse exactly what I had before and I obtain something which depends only on f and on g. So I have norm of p, q, which depends only on one of beta, the norm of A times the norm of U, that would be the norm of A times the norm of F prime, F and V prime, plus same thing that I had there, V prime plus alpha over alpha beta, norm of G, Q prime, plus one over beta the norm of f in v prime. And now I can uh, come up with a way to collect one of the things and you will have norm of p q is controlled by the norm of a plus one over beta norm of f in v prime plus and you have here the norm of a v prime plus alpha over alpha beta norm of g. Q prime, and I forgot. Let me, uh... There we go, okay. Okay. And these inequalities can be massaged and, and one can show some, some much simpler inequality with respect to what I wrote here, but these are the trivial ones that you can recover without too much tricks and tips. And show you that there is control on, on, the, on the boundary condition, on, on, sorry, on the um, U and P, and this control depends on the imp sub conditions on alpha and on beta. So on the imp sub conditions in the operator A and on the operator B. Okay. 
So there's a lot of uh, other tricks that one can show, and one can show that you can get a better proof and better estimates simply by exploiting the subconditions. Uh, and in some cases, the Hilbertian uh, characteristics of this, but uh, this is not essential for the moment. So the essential part here is that both U and P depend on the both F and G. Okay. And the last thing that I wanted to say here is that one, two, and three are equivalent to, uh, let me call this A and B. And uh, one can rewrite A, B transpose B zero as capital A, and capital A is a linear operator that goes from the product space into the dual product space. Okay. And I can ask conditions A, B on A, on capital A. So uh, if I use the graph norm, then I would have a, there exists alpha bar such that the inf, uh, I have to call this C in, so V times Q, I call this bold V, sup uh, theta in bold V, and then I call this bold A, C theta, norms C, norm theta equal alpha bar and the other. Now here, the same is taken there and this is, is, is taken there. And let me write this all on the next page. So the reason why usually once uh, one tries to, to write things separately instead of writing everything at the same time is uh, that it's much easier to, to check the single operator A and operator B rather than to globally check that this is satisfied. But this is exactly equivalent, equivalent to one, two, and three which are the three in conditions on the kernel of A and on B. And, on B. and of course, this has to be the case because you can write the operator as an operator. Okay, so let me stop here. And uh, next week, we are going to do the theory of this. And next Thursday, instead, we are going to uh, understand how things work from an American point of view and how to implement the statute using the library. Okay, questions so far?